All right, everybody, welcome back to Introduction to U.S. Multicultural Literatures. This will be the first of two lectures on Louise Erdrich's novel Antelope Woman. Um, I, we will be talking about, today, we will be talking about the first half of the novel. I think the first uh, nine or ten chapters, we'll, we'll see. And then in the second lecture, we will talk about the second half of the novel. And if you haven't finished reading it yet, that's okay. I won't be doing any spoilers. I'll just confine my comments to the first half today and then we'll talk about the ending and what the ending means for the rest of the book in the next lecture. Uh, so today I want to begin, I just want to begin with a little review of the concept with which we introduced Louise Erdrich in the last lecture and then I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the plot of this novel than I normally spend with novels because even even when we went over the plot of um, The Martyred uh, that was a complicated plot, but this plot is even more complicated than a spy novel, because what's more complicated than a spy novel? A novel about many generations of a very entangled family, which is what Louise Erdrich is giving us in Antelope Woman. She's a novelist very concerned with family, with genealogy, with the way that relates to culture and to race. Um, and so and she's covering multiple, really multiple centuries. The book begins in the middle of the 19th century and ends, uh, or, you know, takes, mostly takes place in the uh, late 20th, early 21st century. So we're going to have to spend a lot of time covering the plot and how everyone in the book is related. And then at the end of this lecture, I want to turn to some passages that begin to express the themes of the novel. And then uh, the next lecture will probably look pretty similar as I cover the plot and then also the themes. Though I think the plot becomes a little bit less complicated as the book goes on, but it, the opening chapters are really the first third of the novel, which sets up the, the genealogy really does require, I think, some explanation. So that's what we're going to do today. I just want to begin with a very brief review of the idea of magical realism. I think this is the broad heading under which you can see the work of Louise Erdrich, as well as of several other novelists of the multicultural late 20th century period, or the broader in world literature, the post-colonial period of late 20th century culture, because magical realism, as you recall, is a type of fiction that begins, that is set in a recognizable historical and social landscape, as Antelope Woman very much is. It makes frequent reference to historical events, uh, especially within the Native American community or that have pertained to the Native American community. And it's set very much in the real world, sometimes in a very gritty way. I mean, it's set very much in urban Minneapolis, if you reach the, those middle chapters about um, Rosen and Richard and Frank and their relationship and their kind of working class, lower middle class existence in urban Minneapolis. It's set, again, in a very gritty way in this lower middle class world. And yet the other thing about magical realism is that into this realistically portrayed social reality, you find intrusions of the supernatural. And this is something that happens throughout the novel. From the beginning of the novel, the nursing male that opens the novel in the chapter Father's Milk, up until um, you know the portrayal of the title antelope woman, Calico Sweetheart, and her various quasi-supernatural uh, behaviors in the middle of the novel. And we also said, though, that magical realism is not just a genre that is, it's not just a genre that does this just to do it. There's a kind of political, broadly speaking, political edge to magical realism, which is that it's often a body of literature written from the perspective of communities that have been in some ways marginalized or oppressed in various ways. If you look at magical realism globally, whether it's the characterizes the writing that came out of Russia in the Stalinist period, whether it characterizes the writings of the Jewish diaspora, whether it um, has a South Asian or a Latin American setting, or it's African American literature or Native American literature, and these are all um, these are all you know bodies of literature that have embraced magical realist aesthetics 
the explanation has tended to be why does magical realism seem to occur in these settings? Well, because it occurs in settings where a group, a population is being dominated or oppressed. And one feature of domination or oppression is that the group doing the dominating or oppressing asserts their vision of reality as the only true one. And magical realism contests that vision of reality by showing reality to be fissured, to be more complicated than that, to be marked by things that it says are impossible, but that in fact are not. And then another, as a corollary to that, magical realism allows for the preservation of cultural beliefs and cultural attitudes that have been uh, marginalized by a group that is oppressing another group. And we see that very clearly in Erdrich's work because part of what accounts for the supernatural in her work is that it's the uh, eruption into reality, into a Western-dominated rationalist paradigm of reality of Native American beliefs, Native American myth, Native American legend, Native American storytelling. And we see that throughout Antelope Woman, where often what is supernatural in the work is Ojibwe or sometimes just broader uh, Native American myth. And that often happens within magical realist literature uh, as a feature of its contest of oppression, going back even before the late 20th century, going back to uh, you know, trends you would see in Central European Jewish literature in the work of Kafka or in Irish literature in the works of Yeats and Joyce in the early 20th century. So this is a pretty dominant kind of global feature of magical realist literature. So with that, just reminder, that introduction, I would like to get into the plot of the novel. I just want to, in the next few slides, I just want to kind of carefully recall to your attention the events of the book so that you can hold them all in your mind because it's a book that you know it probably makes more sense uh, it might make more sense on a second reading it's a book don't miss the fact that there's a family tree at the beginning right after the table of contents in the book you will find a family tree um, and you'll want to refer back to that that will help you understand how the characters are all related to each other so I am just going to go, uh, I'm going to begin a summary. So part one, Bijig, um, is, and I'll, I'll talk about the meanings of, of, of Bijig and the other uh, elements of, because uh, the book is divided into parts one, two, three, and four, and each part has a little prelude. And I want to talk about those, but I want to talk about those a little later. But part one begins with a chapter called Father's Milk. And in Father's Milk, it begins with this character, Scranton Roy, who is descended from seemingly pretty interesting, progressive people. He's a Quaker. His mother is a poet. But he ends up, and we later find out it's because of a uh, kind of forbidden love affair, he ends up joining the army and he, as a soldier, and I think this is taking place in the 1860s, so around the time of the Civil War, he's sent to massacre the Ojibwe, because there were, you know, the, during the time, and I think one of the things Erdrich is doing in this novel is she's offering a reminder of what American history looks like from a Native American perspective. And, uh, and the corollary of that, as you'll see, is that the novel's narrator is giving you, I mentioned history from below, history as seen from below, from those who have been its victims. Um, uh, and, and we'll later find out that the narrator of the novel is, is literally a figure who's giving us history from below, as we'll discuss in a moment. But we don't know the identity of the narrator yet. So far, it just looks like a third-person narrator. But I think one of the things Erdrich is calling into question is ideologies of progress. Because ideologies of progress were always used as a justification for the oppression of Native Americans. Going back to the middle of the last millennium when there was first contact between Europeans and indigenous people in the Americas, the idea was that the way that Europe justified to itself its taking of the land was saying, well, um, 
you know, they, they, the Native Americans aren't doing anything we recognize as progress with the land. And so, in fact, they're not entitled to it. You find this argument very explicitly made in European and then later European American thought. And so ideologies of progress were used as the justification for the dispossession of Native Americans. And so Erdrich is looking at more recent history and she's saying, you know, bear in mind that while the Civil War, for instance, might be an instance of progress insofar as it eliminates slavery in the American South, a genuine instance of progress, I think Louise Erdrich would agree, the same government is nonetheless dispossessing and massacring Native Americans, okay? So it, you can't just take a kind of uni, unipolar approach to looking at history. You have to look at it from different perspectives. And also the attitude toward the state, toward the U.S. government in this novel is pretty much you know, hostile, at least, you know, you, you haven't finished it, but at least in the first half, it's pretty hostile. And that might be a different attitude. So we have to, sometimes in this class, we talk about oppressed or marginalized people in general. And we look at philosophical or literary issues that affect them in general. And I think you can do that. I think you can make connections. But I also think you have to be attentive to differences. And so, you know, the attitude toward the state on the part of a Native American author might be much more hostile, for instance, than that if it, than the attitude toward the state of a group who has come to see the state as guarantor of civil rights, if you see what I mean. Um, and so, you know, I don't know that we've seen this kind of hostility toward uh, the government in, in some of our authors before. Um, you know, even in Robert Hayden's Middle Passage, which was a tremendous indictment against slavery and racism and white supremacy, you nevertheless end with that promise John Quincy Adams arguing the case of the Amistad before the Supreme Court. You end with this idea of possibly America and American government as the bearer of the civil rights struggle, as the guarantor, as the repository of African American civil rights struggle, you know? And that's, and that's an attitude that, you know, it might be harder for a, a Native American writer to hold if we can speak in those kind of generalities. But if we just compare the two authors, Robert Hayden, Louise Erdrich, we see kind of a divergence on this issue. All right, I'm no longer recounting the plot. I'm just, I'm just digressing. So let's go back. So Scranton Roy, a soldier sent to massacre the Ojibwe, kills an old woman and then he sees a child being carried away from the massacre uh, on, a, on a dog sled and he immediately sort of regrets what he's doing after he kills the old woman and she says to him this word that he remembers for the rest of his life and so he immediately seems to want to atone so he follows this baby being carried out on the dog sled and he approaches it and in the novel's first kind of instance of magical realism so right in the heart of this historical event we find this at least unlikely probably maybe it's uh, i don't know if it's purely biologically impossible but seemingly unlikely event that he breastfeeds this baby and nurses her so hence father's milk and raises her as his daughter, Matilda. Then later he meets a young woman named Peace McKnight, who is a Scottish immigrant who becomes who comes to America and becomes the school teacher who teaches Matilda. And they become friends because they're fairly close, you know, in age because she's a very young woman. I don't know if we're given her direct age, but like late teens, let's say. And she ends up marrying Scranton Roy though it seems to be a kind of fraught or ambiguous or ambivalent marriage. And she bears him a son named Augustus. And then she subsequently dies. Meanwhile, we go back to the Ojibwe community. And we find that Matilda's mother, Blue Prairie Woman, is in this terrible mourning because she lost her child, her lost daughter. And she partially sort of psychologically recovers herself by acting as a mother to a dog named Sorrow. So she nurses this dog. And 
Then with her husband, Shawano, she has twins, and we'll come back to them, and sets off in search of Matilda after receiving a new name from the giver of names among the Ojibwe. And why is she given a new name? Because her daughter has left and her daughter has gone away. And so she's given this new name, Other Side of the Sky, because that's where her daughter has gone. She's gone over the horizon. So Matilda then, so Other Side of the Sky, formerly Blue Prairie Woman, comes to where Scranton and Peace and Matilda live and she gets Matilda to go off with her. And then Matilda receives the name Other Side of the Sky. And when her mother, and then they're, they're going off and they're sort of starving as they journey across the land. So her mother brought the dog Sorrow with her and her mother kills the dog and feeds it to Matilda and then dies and then Matilda is adopted by a herd of antelope. So I put antelopes there. Is it antelopes or antelope? I didn't look up the proper plural. Um, but anyway, nevertheless. So we have a couple of different motifs that are going to recur throughout the novel. One of them is this idea of nursing, of giving, giving a child uh, something or an animal something to eat. The idea of a man nursing a child, the idea of a woman nursing a dog, uh, both go to themes in the novel of the fluidity of identity, uh, of gender among humans, but also among of, of a human animal identity. This novel tends to put humans and animals on the same plane, just as it tends to uh, discuss a fluidity of identity of gender among human beings. Another motif going along with that, so we have the idea of animal and human kind of equivalence or animals and humans on a continuum, and the idea of antelope and dogs. They will recur as animal figures throughout the book. And then the idea of twins. So we have Blue Prairie Woman has the twins, um, and then we'll, we'll meet these twins as characters later, and twins as characters will be themes throughout the will be a theme or a motif throughout the novel which has to do with the idea of balance of kind of balance and harmony in the cosmos uh, so just as uh, you know this the the world of this novel is perpetually threatened with imbalance with immoderation and then brought back into balance and I think twins symbolize that equilibrium so that's chapter one Chapter two, Windigo's story, uh, uh, goes into the second generation, because this is a novel that begins in the middle of the 19th century in about the 1860s, but it's going to end up in the present. So it's going to keep up, especially in these opening chapters, a brisk pace as it marches down the generations. So the first thing you need to know, again, this book is kind of has this background of uh, Ojibwe or broader Native American myth underlying the story. The, the realistic story on the surface is always sort of under underlined by, uh, by myth. And so the first thing you have to know is what is Wendigo? So Wendigo refers to a malevolent cannibalistic spirit that may possess a person in Algonquian Ojibwe and other Native American, generally Great Plains Indian myth. So this idea of the Wendigo recurs throughout the book, and it generally recurs to describe, in this particular novel, someone who's possessed by a kind of um, almost evil force of love. Uh, generally, men, so it will be Klaus later, and it's Augustus in this chapter, is possessed by this greedy, predatory, acquisitive type of desire for a woman that lead or multiple women that leads him to undertake kind of evil abusive acts and we see that in this chapter so what happens in this chapter is scranton roy after his wife dies is now a penitent widower and he is really bothered by his act of killing the old ojibwe woman at the beginning of the novel and so he wants to to repent for this act because especially because he was a Quaker and he says I think somewhere in the book he says you know I betrayed the light 
in myself. And that's a Quaker idea of the inner light. And that's another thing we're going to see in this novel is that Erdrich, while she will be very critical of some aspects of European culture, there's other aspects she's very attracted to and thinks are, are compelling. And I think there's aspects of various forms of Christianity that she's attracted to. And I, I think Erdrich herself was raised partially Catholic um, and was raised, um, I think her parents were, one was of generally white heritage, I think German Catholic, and the other was Ojibwe. Um, so she's going to she's gonna be very critical uh, of certain aspects of European culture, but she's also going to look at the things about it that she likes and look at the aspects she likes. And there's nothing in this book that is kind of racially essentialist because most of the characters have partially mixed heritage. They come from this original union uh, that we'll see here of Scranton Roy's son with this Native American family. Um, and so it's very different from, let's say, Amiri Baraka, who is, you know, trying to posit very pure forms of racial identity to combat racism. You know, that's not going to happen in this book. So anyway, I don't know how I got on that. Um, so Scranton Roy, now a penitent widower, he's, he's upset. So he goes with his 23-year-old son, Augustus, to atone for killing the old Ojibwe woman years before. And then he finds... Um, he finds an Ojibwe community that he thinks he can atone to. And so he kills himself while staying with Shawano, who was the husband of Blue Prairie Woman, a.k.a. Other Side of the Sky, and his second spouse or partner, Victoria Muskrat. And they together are raising Blue Prairie Woman and Shawano's twins, Zosie and Mary who, as I'm going to look at in a minute, when we get to the passages, are named after Mary and Joseph uh, from the Christian story of the nativity of, you know, Jesus's mother, Mary, and his, Jesus's stepfather. Can I refer to Joseph as Jesus's stepfather? Uh, Joseph. And that introduces, again, this idea of a kind of, there's going to be cultural fusion in this novel. Again, Erdrich is not interested in, in coming up with some pure idea of Native American culture. She's interested, actually, in exploring, I think, very much an idea of multiculturalism, a fusion of multiple cultures. So you have these Native American children named after Mary and Joseph, and yet you have the fluidity of gender again, because it's twin girls, one of whom bears this name that has been, you know, had belonged to this male in the, in the story. So... Anyway, Augustus falls in love with the twins. And this is one of the things that you have to get used to with Erdrick is she's very funny. She, she sort of writes the whole book in this high comic spirit, even when she's talking about terrible things. And I think we need to consider why... Uh, why she does this. You'll find, if you, do, you know, if you go on websites where they post, you know, user reviews like Goodreads or Amazon, some people don't like reading Louise Erdrich for this reason, uh, that her tone is always this kind of tall tale comic tone, except for the parts that are very poetic, but even those have kind of an edge of, of kind of exaggerated humor. Um, so she represents this love story in a humorous way, but it's really kind of eerie and troubling in certain respects, because the main thing is that uh, Augustus can't tell Zosie and Mary apart, and so he never knows which one of them he's sleeping with. He doesn't know until his first child is born uh, how he can tell you know them apart, and they each end up bearing children to him. And they become kind of rivalrous and try to, uh, you know, try to distinguish each other. And there's even a moment where he even, he tries to wound them to create kind of scars on their bodies so he can tell them apart. And again, Erdrich relates this in this kind of almost comically high-spirited manner, but it's a pretty disturbing story. And I think that goes back to the title of the chapter, Windigo Story, that he's kind of got this possessive love for them uh, that leads him to this, this brink of kind of madness and, and causing them harm. And so he, he you know, he, he's in this kind of faded, fatal love with these twins. 
Now the result in the next chapter, chapter three, answers appropriately titled because he does begin to tell them apart when they bear him children in turn. And they give birth to four children, Peace, who he names for his late mother, uh, who's, who's the only girl, and then Charles, Arthur, and Shawano, named after um, Zosie and Mary's father, who has died by this time. And he tells a little bit about the, Erdrich tells a little bit about the childhood of these children, particularly in a moment where an unscrupulous Indian agent tries to kidnap the children to a boarding school. And Erdrich is referring to this movement at the end of the 19th century for the assimilation of Native Americans to mainstream, you know, American, what was considered mainstream American culture. And the way this was affected was through the Indian boarding school movement. And what would happen was Native American children would go to these boarding schools and they would be, um, you know, they might arrive there in the dress of their community and the hairstyle of their community, speaking the language of their community. And they were quickly put into, you know, suits and dresses as was seen as the appropriate attire for European American children. You know, their hair was cut. They were forbidden to speak that language and they were instructed in the curriculum of what was considered to be, you know, dominant culture, American curriculum. Now, was this a forced move? Um, not officially in all places, but it was, you know, it was something that was heavily incentivized. If Native Americans wanted to, you know, uh, assimilate into mainstream culture, then they had to go with this boarding school movement. And one of the things Erdrich stresses here is she has the unscrupulous Indian agent who tries to kidnap Augustus and Zosie and Mary's kids into a boarding school. And one of the things, just as Erdrich shows aspects of European American or European culture that she likes, as well as aspects she criticizes, so she has an eye for, and she's very satirical toward, ways in which Native Americans were enticed to be complicit in their own oppression. And this is a motif you see throughout the novel. So she's not ever about identifying good people and bad people based on race or culture. She's more interested in what values are different people upholding. And so she shows this unscrupulous Indian agent upholding this dominant culture value, but peace successfully fends him off, essentially just beats him up until um, he goes away. And, you know, there's a moment where the onlookers are, you know, or he says to them something like, well, or he says to Augustus, you know, these kids will grow up to be illiterate drunks, this kind of stereotype of what Native Americans would be if they were not saved, quote unquote, by European culture. And Augustus quickly turns to peace and starts asking her these very high level mathematical questions that she answers right away and he's you know he's homeschooling her and the idea is that he's better off homeschooling her with Zosie and Mary because he's giving her what it sounds like the way Erdrich portrays it is he's giving the children kind of the best of the European tradition Zosie and Mary are giving them the best of the Native American tradition whereas all they're going to get at a boarding school would be this dominant culture paradigm that upholds the aspects of European and European American culture that Erdrich disdains, which we're going to talk about which aspects those are. But roughly now, I'll say, you know, acquisitiveness, greed, capitalism, that's that's what she sees as the bad part of that culture. However, she's also careful to note that the children being educated at home get a part of the Native American tradition that she doesn't really represent throughout the novel very positively which is, and I think it's something we can compare very directly to the kind of black nationalism in the African-American tradition that Baraka was promoting, which was a kind of very male-dominated, violence-fetishizing form of resistance. And I think for Erdrich, the problem with that is that it replicates the worst traits of the things they're fighting against. The book begins with a massacre. And the massacre is to acquire land. And I think Erdrich doesn't really see 
any salvation for Native Americans or for anybody else coming from this kind of fetishism of violence, this version of traditional culture that upholds masculinity. And later in the book, she represents the American Indian movement of the 1960s, which was very directly parallel with the Black Power movement as being the same way, as being kind of oppressive to women, being this kind of swaggering, phallic, male, aggressive movement. And she represents that as a, a part of Native American resistance to dominant culture that she doesn't think is, is working very well. And that comes out in this chapter when there are some visitors to Augustus and Zosie and Mary's house named Stone and C. Clear, who they tr teach particularly the boys, Charles, Ar Arthur, and Shawano, they are saying things like, you know, if we wanted to succeed as Native Americans, we should have just killed them all. We should have just, we, you know, we killed the whites and we should just go on killing the whites and violence is really the redemptive answer. And that leads Charles, Arthur, and Shawano to become very interested in becoming warriors. But does that lead them to advance the Native American community? No, it leads them to sign up to join the U.S. Army and fight in, in the First World War. So we're now we're at the beginning of the, or the first, you know, quarter of the 20th century, which doesn't really do anything for the Native American community and doesn't do much for them either. Okay, so, so uh, again, we see Erdrich, uh, and also this is the chapter where Peace grows up. If her brothers grow up to become soldiers, she grows up to be the first Indian to work in a bank. And yet Erdrich portrays this very dubiously. Why are people so interested in money and this meaningless paper? So she sees this family kind of assimilating into norms that aren't good the you know greed acquisitiveness or violence and she portrays the violent part as coming from a version of native american culture that she doesn't look very kindly on and she portrays the part about greed and acquisitiveness as coming from the part of european culture that she looks you know looks down upon so it's a very complex set of authorial attitudes that I think you can read into these plot developments. Though, the, Erdrich is also not shy about interjecting in her novel kind of editorially, as we'll see when we look at some of the passages. Um, and if you read multiple, I, I know I've only asked you to read one of her books, but if you read more of her books, you know, you begin to, to really see where her, where her loyalties are. So the next chapter, The Blitzkuchen, and sorry if I mispronounced, so I, you know, I neither speak Ojibwe nor German, uh, which are the two languages featured most heavily in this novel, so I'm sure I might have mispronounced some words along the way for which I apologize. Um, I hope all of my uh, exaggeratedly correct pronunciations of French throughout the semester make up for it. But anyway, the next chapter, the Blitzkuchen, which I think refers to the idea of... Um, uh, I don't actually know if this is a real German word, but it's, I think it's like a... Um, the, the Blitz Kitchen, sort of cooking during wartime. So this is another chapter where she portrays something sort of horrible, but as a joke, really, as a kind of comic skit, almost. So Augustus dies during the war, and then the three brothers return after the war, and Shawano in particular, because the other two brothers didn't, seems like they didn't see much combat. They got kind of, you know, they played roles in the army that weren't um, focused on combat, but Shawano did see combat, and he saw his friend be killed, and so he comes back from the war heavily traumatized by these violent experiences. So Stone and C. Clear, the same visitors that had attracted him to this idea of being a warrior, tell him that, while well, the way to get over this, because they always propose a violent solution, the way to get over the fact that these Germans, you know, over in Europe killed your friend is to enslave a German. If you enslave a German, you'll sort of make up for this. It'll be like a kind of tit for tat. And so there's a young German immigrant, because it sounds like some German immigrant communities of like young men have come over to America uh, 
you know, in this area, because the novel, remember, is set around here. It's set in the upper Midwest, where there's a lot of German and Northern European immigration. So he kidnaps a young German immigrant, and him and his brothers and Stone and Seaclair just kidnap this guy, and they're kind of standing around talking about what they're going to do with him. Are they going to you know, torture him? Are they going to make him work? Are they going to kill him? What are they going to do with him? And he pleads for his life. He's, you know, he basically signals to them. And one of the interesting things about the chapter is their dialogue is in Ojibwe and his dialogue is in German. So they don't understand each other. And if you don't read those two languages, as frankly I don't and maybe many people don't, you, you're sort of missing out on what they're saying too. But contextually, it seems that he's pleading for his life by saying he'll cook for them. And he ends up baking them a cake this young german man named klaus and the cake is so good that they decide you know to it, it sort of brings everyone together almost in a spiritual communion around how good this cake is and they they let him go and we're informed at the end of the chapter that because there's a lot of kind of time jumps in this book as it's sort of bringing us down through time uh that that shawano ends up going to the twin cities he's dealing with shell shock he's dealing with alcoholism but he has a son that he names klaus after this uh german man that he kidnapped so that's that chapter then we move into part two Nij, and we find uh chapter five windigo dog and this is where again magical realism kicks in in a big way because we learn in chapter five that the narrator of the novel, and I think, you know, if, you're, if you've read a lot of novels before, it just felt like we had a third person novel. Uh, and it was a third person omniscient novel. It went, through, you know, into the heads of various characters. We learn what almost every major character is thinking so far. And this is a book where it's hard to talk about main characters because there's so many characters and it's just overflowing with stories but we learn that in fact the narrator is a dog and it's been this dog that has been telling us the story the whole time and it's a dog who remember everybody in this book is related to everybody else so this dog is descended from the dog sorrow whom blue prairie woman nursed when she was trying to get over the her loss of Matilda, a.k.a. Other Side of the Sky, in the first chapter. So now we have a dog in the present who is descended from this 19th century dog. And our dog narrator is named Almost Soup by a little girl who rescues him from her grandmother's attempt to cook him in soup. And he says throughout the chapter that he's not like he's not a he's not a big dog he's not an important dog he's kind of this um outcast dog that was almost cooked and he's giving you the dog's eye view of this history and so a couple themes emerge here one is the importance of animals animals as a part of just a continuum of life that includes humans but is not dominated by humans and i think that that is something louise erdrich sees as an important part of the Ojibwe value system. I also think, though, that she sees it as part of a of a European tradition that was kind of, um, kind of uh, taken over by by capitalism. But there's hints in the European tradition that this is true as well. That there's just a continuum of life. And then also, it's not just any animal that's telling us this story, but it's a lowly animal. So this is literally history from below, history from the perspective of this poor dog that gets kind of abused and is almost cooked. So that's that's the perspective. And why is he called Windigo Dog? Um, is is this dog kind of a malevolent spirit? We'll have to we'll have to watch out for that idea and think about what we what we conclude as we see more of the plot in the second half of the book. So the dog narrator, uh, almost soup, then advances the story straight up to the present. So peace has had a son and because she was afraid of having twins because her mother, her, her mothers, were Zosie and Mary, who were this very troubling couple of twins. But the son then fathered twins, Gizis and Nudin, with names which mean sun and wind, 
who were raised by peace. And Gizus and Nudin become the parents, if you consult your family tree at the beginning of the novel, Gizus and Nudin become the parents of, um, well, Nudin is the mother of Rosen, who is going to be one of the major characters from, from now on. And uh, Gizus is the mother of Cecile, who is New Rosen's cousin, who will also become a character. So that's how the narrative advances to the present, because now we're going to have Gizus and Newton's children as the story, and the novel now has a modern urban setting. So what happens in this modern urban setting? Well, chapter six, the t title chapter, The Antelope Woman, kicks off the, the contemporary part of the plot. In chapter six, Klaus, the son of Shawano, becomes obsessed, kind of windigo possessed, obsessed by this woman's sweetheart Calico and her three daughters. And when what is the setting? The setting is Montana. He's selling various wares at a powwow and he sees them and he becomes obsessed with them. And his obsession leads him. So again, we have this theme of kind of Wendigo love, of this kind of possessive, acquisitive, abusive love uh, that leads him to kidnap Sweetheart Calico from the powwow. And he takes her back with him to where he lives in urban Minneapolis. He lives in a house, ironically, off of Franklin Avenue on Andrew Jackson Street. And if you know anything about U.S. history, you'll know that Andrew Jackson was one of the American presidents most responsible for the removal of Native Americans, particularly in the uh, South, uh, around like Georgia and places like that, from their territory and on the Trail of Tears. So, you know, the irony of Native Americans being forced to live on this street named after their, you know, one of the great, uh, one of the big oppressors of Native American civilization. So he takes her with him and they have this, um, they have this terrible relationship that's kind of abusive and obsessive and he ties her up at night but then she escapes and then once she comes back she starts tying him up at night and she never speaks and again Erdrich relates this all in a strangely disaffected or affectless tone um, it might even be, I mean, Erdrich is also a postmodern novelist, I would say, as well as a multicultural novelist. And one of the ways you can tell she's a postmodern novelist is her metafiction. So this novel, you know, is a, a novel that constantly refers to storytelling and to stories. It's a novel where the narrator, who is a dog, uh, reflects on the telling of the story. So there's a lot of meta fictional qualities to it. But it, and, and it also has that postmodern idea of the relativism of all perspectives, you know, the, um, all, all life being on a continuum, all culture being on a continuum. And I also think maybe this kind of style of narration um, might be part of that postmodern waning of affect, that the, these events that are so strange and often so disturbing are told in this voice that doesn't have a lot of emotion or that almost is tongue-in-cheek or has a kind of winking quality to it. Anyway, we learn uh, in this chapter that Sweetheart Calico is the titular antelope woman. So she, I don't know if she's our main character, but she's our title character. And she is a descendant of Matilda, aka Other Side of the Earth, and thus from Blue Prairie Woman, also also known as Other Side of the Earth. And, you know, Matilda was last seen running away with the antelope. So she's the antelope woman because she is presumably part antelope, the result of a kind of mating with an antelope. And this also makes her Klaus's distant cousin. Almost everybody in this book, including all the lovers, are related. Uh, so this is a book about how history works itself out in genealogies, how, um, how history works itself out in family relations, even to the point of incestuous relations, because she's his cousin, because he's the son of Shawano, who's descended 
from Blue Prairie Woman. And she's descended from Blue Prairie Woman. So, sorry, I'm looking at the family tree. I should have put the family tree on the slide. So he's descended from Blue Prairie Woman via uh, Marion's Joji. And he uh, he is. And she's descended from Blue Prairie Woman via Matilda. So that makes them cousins. But, you know, soon we're going to find out that, you know, Rosen is going to have an affair with Frank, who's uh, her cousin, because they're both descended in different ways from Augustus Roy and Mary and Josie. So, uh, so everybody in this book is related. All right, moving along. Chapter 7, I think one of the most uh, bravura chapters, one of the most virtuoso chapters in the book, The Ojibwe Week, where every subsection of the chapter is named for a day of the week in Ojibwe. In this one, we get the description of Klaus and Calico Sweetheart's terrible relationship and how she escapes before she returns with a dog who is also descended from Sorrow, the originary dog of the novel, whom Blue Prairie Woman nursed. So the animals, like the people, are all kind of have this common descent. The narrative then shifts to Rosen. Rosen becomes the focal character for a lot of this chapter. She's descended from Augustus and Zosie and Mary through Peace and Newton, and she's married to Richard Whiteheart Beads, who is Klaus's unscrupulous friend with whom she has the twins, Callie and Deanna. So, number one, twins again, Callie and Deanna. So this is the novel's, what, uh, third pair of twins after Gizus and Newton and after Joji and Mary. So we have twins. And then we have this idea of very unscrupulous behavior among certain Native American characters that makes them complicit in the oppression of Native Americans. So what is it, what is it that Richard Whiteheart Beads is doing that's so unscrupulous? Well, he and Klaus have taken a payoff to dispose of the toxic waste of these carpets from shopping malls. And what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to uh, dispose of them, you're supposed to dispose of them in a certified site for disposal, but that costs more money on the part of the people who have to dispose of them. So instead they pay off these two guys, Richard and Klaus, to just put it in this house on Native American territory or in this barn. So what are they doing? They're taking the toxic waste of a consumer capitalist society, which Erdrich always finds uh, worthy of critique and satire, and they're just kind of dumping it on Native American land. So like the unscrupulous Indian agent who tried to kidnap Augustus and Zosie and Mary's kids to the boarding school, now you have these unscrupulous guys trying to essentially pollute for the for no better reason than that they're getting a bribe or a payoff pollute native american land so in the midst of all this rosen falls in love with klaus's brother and thus her cousin frank shawano and what does he do he's a baker he's a cook and baking has been in this novel a redemptive act if, you know, there's the toxic waste of the consumer society as, as symbolized by these mall carpets, the baking of goods, the making of food to share among people from when the first Klaus did it when Shawano kidnapped him to now Frank Shawano doing it. Uh, baking, making food is akin to telling stories in this novel. That's the, that's the redemptive act that brings communities together. So she begins to fall in love with Frank and to fall out of love with Richard Whiteheart Beads. The next chapter is just a brief comic story, Why I Am No Longer Friends with Whiteheart Beads, and it's about how Richard Whiteheart Beads betrays Klaus. So he's given these two tickets to Maui, uh, Richard that is, and he gives them to Klaus as a gift. And so Klaus goes with Calico Sweetheart to Maui but the whole time they're being followed and it turns out he gave them the tickets so that these guys would think that Klaus was Richard and arrest him for illegal dumping. And that's what happens at the end of the chapter. And then the sort of comical aspect of it is these guys watch him 
because they can't fly out till the next day. So he's in the hot tub with calico beads while these guys in suits are watching them. And then presumably he makes love with calico beads while they're like outside the door. And then finally they take him back uh, to to uh, Minnesota where he's going to be arrested for this illegal dumping operation they've been involved with. And then chapter nine, I think it's the last chapter of my incredibly long <laughs> plot summary. Um, how long have I talked? I I'll talk for about uh, 10 or 15 more minutes. I I'll, I'll do the last of the plot summary and then I'll read a few passages with you. So chapter nine, the dear husband. In this chapter, Richard makes the two terrible discoveries. Number one, that his wife is essentially cheating on him, is in love with Frank, and that Klaus has informed on him to the police, that Klaus just told the police everything about what they were doing to try to, you know, get himself out of these charges. Meanwhile, the twins' grandparents, uh, the, um, so Callie and Deanna's, the twins, the, the little kid twins, uh, the daughters of Rosen and Richard, their grandmothers, who are also twins, Gizus and Newton, or I guess one of them is their grandmother and the other is their great, uh, great aunt, they come to, you know, they come to town because, you know, the kids are going through a divorce and their dad's going to be arrested and whatnot. So they come to town and they see Sweetheart Calico. And they immediately recognize they don't like her. They find her kind of creepy because she doesn't talk. This is another strange thing about this novel, by the way, which is maybe something we could criticize Louise Erdrich for on both technical grounds and ethical grounds. It's both a hole in the plot and, um, like, does she think this is okay? So everybody in the book knows that Klaus kidnapped this woman and brought her to live there. But nobody seems to do anything about it. Nobody's like shouldn't we call the police uh, to get her back, you know, to her family? Uh, they just sort of accept this, you know, and, and Rosen says to Klaus, you know, you should go to jail for this at one point in the book, but she doesn't do anything. Nobody else in the book does anything. And, and if anything, they're kind of suspicious of this woman who's been kidnapped. And so we, maybe we should ask ourselves, is that is that a hole in the plot in, insofar as that's not plausible human behavior? Is that an maybe an ethical lapse on behalf of these characters that none of them do anything. Um, so I don't know. I leave that to you. I leave that to you to think about. But in any case, everybody just accepts that she lives there now. But a lot of people are suspicious of her because remember, she doesn't speak. And some of her behavior is kind of erratic, though, you know, understandably, she's trying to escape. But anyway, <laughs> New New Gizus and Newton Whatever we think of Louise Erdrich's technical or ethical choices there, let's just get on with the plot. Gizus and Newton see her, they're kind of suspicious of her, and they reveal that she is descended from Blue Prairie Woman, who, and now we learn a little bit about Blue Prairie Woman's background, we have a little bit of a flashback, which is that before Blue Prairie Woman married Shawano and had Matilda and Zosie and Mary, she had been essentially married to a deer that she went into the woods she formed a relationship with this deer and only after her you know her community came and brought her back did she marry shawana so we have again this theme of people having relationships with animals animals and humans being on the same continuum um we already saw that matilda ran you know ran away with the antelope and so uh sweetheart calico is descended from blue prairie woman who had a relationship with a deer just as matilda had a relationship with an antelope and so in that sense she's the antelope woman all right so that i think brings us to the the middle of the book so now we have to read on to see what develops out of this out of this plot i now want to just look in the let's say 10 well yeah i'll talk for 10 more minutes and the 10 minutes remaining to us i want to look at a couple of different passages from the book and see how they bring out some of the themes of the novel though i also think this is a novel where the plot as i was just describing it to you carries a lot of the weight of the themes so parts one and two begin with these prologues that are about twins 
who are sewing the world into being, one twin using light, the other using dark, and they're trying to outdo each other. And so they're trying to upset the balance. They're trying to wait till the other one falls asleep so the, so the one who's still awake can weave more, um, or sew, I guess sewing is not weaving. They're trying to sew more. And the idea here is, I think, that the world is being woven into being through this kind of act of storytelling and through this creation, and it requires both dark and light. And the point is to keep dark and light in balance and not let one get out of control. Uh, and I think that that is where we can see some of the things that maybe are ethically troubling to us or are ethically troubling to some of the people who are reviewing this book on popular reviewing sites. The way, you know, I saw a review that was just like, Louise Erdrich portrays this man kidnapping this woman. Like, it's just nothing. Uh, how can she do this? And I think this might not be an adequate answer and i you know and i and i think that she also has characters say in the book you should go to jail for this so it's not like the ethical issue isn't raised but i think part of erdrick's message that might be a little bit hard to accept but we should at least consider it is that in the spiritual worldview she's trying to develop darkness and light good and evil are inevitable parts of the weaving of the world you're not going to eliminate darkness. You're not going to eliminate evil. And I think she is incredibly suspicious of ideologies that seek to eliminate the darkness from the world because that looks too much to her like the idea of progress, which led to the dispossession and in some cases the extermination of Native Americans. So it's important to keep this holism in mind and at the end of the prologue of part two the narrator says do you know that these beads are sewn onto the fabric of the earth with endless strands of human muscle human sinew human hair we are as crucial to this making as other animals no more and no less important than the deer so animals humans all of nature participates in this weaving of the world out of dark and light elements. And the main thing is not to let them get out of, out of balance. Uh, the main thing is to keep them in balance, not to try to eliminate the dark side. And I think that's the symbolism twins hold in this book. So, and I think this is the magical realism. This is the, this is Erdrich using these mythological tales throughout her work to communicate what she sees as a Native American Ojibwe spiritual worldview, and even aspects of, I think, what she sees as an occluded European tradition that has itself been corrupted by capitalism, but that also had some of these insights in its own background. So that's the importance of storytelling. By the way, Bejig, Nij, these mean one and two. So part one, Bejig, she gives us the word one and the word two in Ojibwe. So she's also trying to, she gives us a multilingual novel. There's a lot of Ojibwe and there's quite a bit of German at certain parts in this book. So the world is made up of many languages is also part of her theme. So storytelling is really important though because storytelling is how language makes the weave of the world. So our narrator on the very second or third page of the book says, what happened to him, that is to Scranton Roy, lives on, though fading in the larger memory, and I relate it here in order that it not be lost. So it's important to tell stories, to pass on stories, to pass down stories, because that's how things are preserved, and that's how the way the world is woven or sewn. I keep saying woven, but they're described as sewing, because they're sewing, here's the thing, they're sewing beads onto uh, they're sewing beads together to create a kind of fabric. Uh, but I keep saying weaving, which is a completely different uh, technology. But I'm not very good at these uh, these textile uh, images. But anyway, the way the world is sewn together, um, that's the way history is passed on. So it's very important in this book that national history, family history, cultural history be passed down 
and be related. And storytelling is in language what using beads, sewing beads is in the realm of material, material culture. And when uh, the the way that uh, I think it's at this point in the book, uh, Zosie and Mary's weaving is described. It's very similar to the way that Erdrich writes. The twins' beadwork was tight and true. No visible beginning or end to the design. Impossible to find the starting knot, the final tie. So, Oji so this is you know a description of Ojibwe beadwork, but it's also a description of Erdrich's storytelling style. We have a novel that it's very hard to identify a main character or a main plot because there's so many stories. And then another thing to know about Louise Erdrich is most of her books are related. I think Antelope Woman is less related to her other books than some of the other ones are, but most of her books are about the same kind of sets of families in Minnesota and North Dakota. And so her books never really end or begin. They're just sort of part of this endless fabric of storytelling that's akin to this beadwork that is endless, that is unfinished, that is sort of not unbegun and unfinished. It's just the endless ongoingness of the world represented in the mythological twins beadwork that makes the world out of us, out of our lives and out of the animals' lives. So that is the importance of narration and storytelling to this novel. Um, and then I'm going to end with this, with this. So what is it? I've alluded over and over again to the parts of European, European American culture that Erdrich criticizes, and also the parts of Native American life that she sees as being complicit with it. And I think it has everything to do with land sovereignty and capitalism. So she refers early in the book to the Dawes Act. The Dawes Act was a piece of legislation passed in 1887 which turned Native American reservation land into private property. And it did this what it was trying what they were trying to do was they were trying again to assimilate Native Americans. And I say they, but there were Native American legislators including the first and I think so far only Native American vice president of the United States, Charles Curtis, participated in some of this legislation as well. Um, so there were Native Americans and European Americans sort of collaborating. The idea was to bring Native Americans into modernity. So we have this ideolo ideology of progress by liquidating the old tribal land titles, according to which certain land allotments were held by Native American tribes and parceling those out as private property to individual Native Americans or their families. So you turn collective land allotments into private holdings. And the idea, the people that did this, I think some of them at least, and especially some of the Native Americans who were part of this, were trying to do something good for Native Americans on the grounds that they thought they had to come into modernity, and modernity is based on capitalism and private property. But for Erdrich, what this ended up doing was it ended up getting rid of a whole holistic worldview according to which land is not private property and land is not pri privately owned, but is collectively you know, stewarded so it got rid of that ideology, and then practically on the ground, what it ended up doing was putting Native Americans, you know, into the into debt by white people who would give them loans to buy this land. So it ends up putting Native Americans in debt pragmatically, and it ends up destroying their kind of spiritual worldview. And why? What is this based on? Well, it's based on capitalism, and so later in the book when she's describing peace she says peace becomes the first indian to work in a bank and i think you know we're very accustomed to historical firsts you know un underrepresented marginalized groups um 
precisely the way in which they're underrepresented is they don't find themselves participating in various important institutions because they're excluded on the basis of racism. But Erdrich throughout the book, at least twice in the first half, undermines this idea. She says, well, Peace is the first Indian to work in a bank. And then how does she describe uh, Peace's attitude? She says, later, much later, she became a teller and then a manager. Indian people came to the bank just to look at her and see for themselves that one of them knew how to handle the white man's white metal, Jania. It was this stuff, this material of no possible use, that their parents and grandparents had been forced to admit into their lives. Americans seemed glad to perish over pitiless coin and paper, which now controlled their destinies, but seemed still, in its essence, a symptom of madness. So, just as with the Dawes Act, which seems like it might be progress for Native Americans, especially when Native American politicians like Charles Curtis are participating in its creation. So it might be good to be the first Indian to work in a bank. Similarly, in the second, in the, in the middle of the book, when um, Richard Whitehart Beads wants to become the first native owned waste disposal company in the whole US, he's already proud of it proud of our imaginary management expertise and good old-fashioned ability to haul shit. So in other words, all of these milestones of progress are not progress. They're assimilating into something it's not worth assimilating into. You're just dealing with trash, you're hauling shit, you're moving around meaningless metal, you're going into debt to do all this. And so Erdrich doesn't think there's any, there's anything to celebrate in being the first Indian to work in a bank, the first native owned waste disposal company. These firsts, as this novel represents it, aren't meaningful because they're not, I mean, they're not worth anything when white people are doing them from Erdrich's perspective. I'm not making claims, by the way. I'm trying to transmit the claims I, I see Erdrich making. Um, and so that's going to be, you know, then in other parts of the book, you're going to see aspects of European culture that she likes and thinks should be fused with the good parts of European culture. She sees Native Americans as complicit in this Euro-derived capitalism, though, at this point in the book, and she criticizes it. So we've put a lot of themes on the table here. It's a very complicated novel. Uh, and I want to, I think I've been talking for a little over an hour, so I don't want to, I don't want to try your patience. Uh, so for the next lecture, please finish the book. I will characterize the rest of the plot, and then we will deal with some more of the novel's themes and how it transmits them. Uh, in the meantime, have a great day, and thanks very much for your attention.